Welcome to Tennis 2020, real talk, real people, real life. I'm Dewey Evans, and I want to thank Austin Tennis Academy and EKH Media for making this broadcast possible. Uh, today, we're talking to a part of the world that we haven't spoken to yet. We're going north of the border to Surrey and British Columbia and talking to a coach who has taken the whole online resources to another level where a lot of people are posting videos with challenges and things for people involved in tennis. He's actually making a resource that coaches would use on an ongoing basis uh, available to everyone. Um, his name's Zach Olin, and Zach, welcome to Tennis 2020. How are you doing, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Um, how are things north of the border in your part of the world? Well, I mean, it's uh, other than maybe uh, perhaps some uh, differences in the weather, the we're all dealing with the same uh, same difficult situations, difficult times these days, and uh, coping as best as we can. Here. You know, I think there are still 10 states, I believe it changes on a daily, but that aren't in a, you know, shelter in place, stay at home type of order. So it is very different. And in some places it is city to city or county to county. Um, what are right. what are the restrictions that you're under up there? Um, well, BC has actually been a little bit less um, severe than some of the other provinces, um, but it's very much everyone is under the same sort of guidelines of obviously staying at home as much as possible as possible and maintaining social distancing. Um, most, you know, most restaurants are still open, but not for dine in only takeout. Um, any businesses that require physical contact have been required to shut down. All the bars are shut down. Um, but we're, uh, the stats over the last seven or seven to 10 days have shown uh, a, a flattening of the curve for the time being in BC, whereas Ontario and Quebec have not seen that yet. Oh. And so they're still under some, some stricter guidelines. Mm -hmm. And so you are full-time performance director at a facility or with a company that operates a couple of facilities. Um, what tennis look like at those facilities at the moment? Yeah, so uh, at the moment we're completely shut down. Uh, we've had to cease all uh, regular programming. Uh, and so they things are pretty quiet. So the resource, well, you've come up with some resources and you've posted some things on Facebook for people to be able to access for free. Um, are these resources that you had available previously or things that you came up with recently? Uh, a little bit of both. Uh, you know, this was all brought on by uh, the same thing. And I think everyone's sort of engaging in the same process of, of being stuck at home and saying, okay, how can I, how can I contribute and keep myself busy? And so, uh, a little bit of both. It started with this idea of what you know. What can I develop to help help uh, our players improve while they're stuck at home? Um, and so the this tactical workbook that we're talking about uh, was just developed in the last last couple of weeks. Um, I've also got a, a sort of a, a self assessment tool on there for for sort of training habits, and that's that's been around for for a while now. So fifty fifty. We're going to bring up the tactical workbook, and um, if we can kind of walk us through it, obviously, title page, and then there are some acknowledgments, and I think we can stay on the acknowledge. If you kind of go down to the next one, Kim. So the special, no, nope, back up one. Yeah, right there. So there's some pretty significant names right there, Louis Kaye um, and Larry and Wayne. They're, those are people who are known you know, uh, all over. And so yep. how is it that you were able to get them to be part of this project that you put together? Well, it's, it's important that I represent things accurately. And so the, you know, the, they weren't involved in any great, you know, I work for Larry, let's, let's make that clear. So we, we, you know, we talk tennis on a, on a very regular basis. Um, and then Wayne is obviously one of the, one of the leaders in the province. And so, I've been back and forth with him over the years on occasion when we when we see each other or when when I when I produce some written content because he's developed a ton of uh, a ton of resources for coaches over the years and so we've gone back and forth. 
and then Louis wasn't involved in this at all, except for the fact that he's the originator of, of so much of the good coach ed material that's out there. And it just, it wouldn't be right for me to put any of this out there without crediting any of these, these uh, people. Yeah. I think when I first met you in some of the Facebook forums, maybe Larry might've still been very, very close to Louis in terms of their working relationship. I think Larry was still in the UK at that point in time. Um, so, yeah. so great resources, right? So we can say right off the bat, as we scroll through this, the information yeah, here very, is- Very, very, very fortunate. And, uh, you know, just always keep in mind that a great deal of this is stolen from someone smarter than me. So, yeah. Cool. Well, if we just kind of go through screen by screen. So, well, I guess first of all, what was the, what was the goal in putting out this resource other than giving something for the players to do because this is very tactically oriented right yeah my my thought process was you know what what can we what can what can players do when they're off court in these times to improve and everyone knows they can do fitness but i'm not a fitness expert and i don't want to pretend to be one everyone knows they can be hitting against a wall or they can be doing coordination stuff but there's a plethora of resources out there and i thought like okay well what's What's a you know where is there a gap? Um, and it occurred to me that this would be a really good time to to study the game for the players and to not just watch matches but to take an analytical approach and, and learn a thing or two. Um, and so that was you know that was the genesis of the of the workbook. And then I'm a I'm a big believer of the of the notion that a rising tide lifts all boats. And and I think if if I can get this out there and and it and it uh, you know contributes to the game in some small tiny pr some small tiny way um, that in the end that comes back to benefit me I think okay so is this geared more towards players to use on their own or for coaches to use with players I think it would need some coach involvement just to you know it, there's a lot there's actually a lot in there I, I, even I didn't realize after making it until I went through it with the players you know we started a while back and we're still not through it all we've been going through chunk of, you know, a chunk at a time. So there's a lot there and it might take some time to digest. And it also needs uh, a trained eye because there's only so much that you can explain in a PowerPoint slide versus an actual face-to-face -face conversation. Right. Okay. Well, I guess if we go back to it, can you just kind of broad brush slide? Um, obviously talking yeah, about patterns. So, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I, 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 I titled it the way I did because I didn't want um, well, let me just say this. Yeah, it's we, there's a million different ways of looking at the game. You know, however you want to break it down, whether it's uh, whether it's by pattern or whether it's by you know volatility and system five or whether you've got your own system. So there's tons of ways. This was just a uh, an approach that I that I have found in the last little while and that I and that I like. Um, and so it's just an overview of some of the. It's maybe not the traditional view of uh of patterns in the sense of serve wide and then go to the open quarter that sort of thing but it's just uh patterns that you can execute uh when both players are back and it's and the, the idea here is to give you just a sense of okay what are all the different options when i get a ball in the middle or when i get a ball to the sides uh because once you know that then you can sort of assess your own game and say okay i like to open up the court with a short angle, but I don't like going cross into line. I don't like changing directions. So that's not a strength of mine. Or you can say, okay, well, I get a ball to the side. My game style is more to move the person. So I'm going to be changing direction more. Oh, my game style is more to overpower them. So I'm going to stay in the cross court and just try and win the cross court. So it can give a bit of a framework to look and see how your game style, uh, you know, dictates the way you play in certain situations. And I would say the underlying things all lead to links. What are those links and yeah so if you go if you go back a slide sorry not to to direct you here um yeah so those are all just links to uh just short you know 10 15 second clips of uh some of the pros executing these patterns um and so you can see there's an example of you know controlling the middle you take a ball from the middle uh, out of the middle but you can do that on offense you can do it in the rally and you can also do it when you're defending and then same thing for changing direction. You can change direction when you're attacking, change direction in the rally, but you can also change direction line into cross or cross into line on defense. So those are all examples, uh, sort of visual examples of the pros uh, doing those patterns to uh, to sort of uh, help uh, explain them. 
on the next slide, uh, the link is a link to a uh, professional match. Uh, I don't off the top of my head remember which one it is, but it's a uh, it's a it's a full match that's available on YouTube uh, that the kids can use to to study. Okay. And then the. Uh... Yeah, and so then and so then we go okay into approaching and passing patterns and uh, once again a million different ways to break it down. So I don't uh, don't pretend that this is the the only way. But uh, what a but we basically say three ways to come to the net. You can approach, which is the sort of traditional get a short ball. You've decided before you hit that you're coming in. Attack and follow, which you see a lot uh, on the men's uh, well, men's and women's game. You attack. You see that it's a good shot. You come in after that. Um, and then attack and sneak, where they pop a ball up and you sneak in afterwards. Uh, and then four ways to pass: play at you know, play at the feet, pass with power, pass with precision, and lob. Um, and so that's that's a sort of overview. And then uh, I should say that I, I do think that a big part of the the you know the importance of this or the importance in executing this document is in the homework. You know, the kids have to be doing the the kids have to be doing the homework, and the homework has to be corrected by the coaches. Because just having gone through this myself and seeing the seeing the work that the kids hand in there's some great work um but you also start to see where the misunderstandings are or where people don't quite uh where kids maybe don't pick up the nuances between certain things and so uh having them do the homework is is really critical so the devil lies in the details as with most things um as with most things absolutely good so you go through um, the yeah, various the... yeah so you go through all of the phases of play in the document, if I remember correctly. So if you were to look at, you know, both people back or one or the other coming to the net and serving and returning. So you break it down mm -hmm. into those game situations. I don't think I saw one where both people are at the net, though, if, you know, Louis being probably the best not, doubles coach yeah. in the world, both at the net happens a lot in doubles, right? That for sure. That, that yeah, is this a situation. is certainly meant to be a meant to be a singles uh, singles uh, specific thing, only because yeah, once you get into doubles, you've got four times the work. So okay, and so there the homework, the things that players are asked to do. There are some things where you know they watch a match and they critique it. I believe there are also some things where they are um, taking some of their own video and critiquing it or comparing and contrasting it yep. to the pros. Is that true? Yeah, it, yeah. Whenever possible, um, yeah. There's a couple a couple assignments that rely on the the kids to uh, to watch video of the pros, and then there's a couple where I've said, okay, now find find a video that you've got. Uh, of yourself playing a match because most, uh, you know, quite often we try to film our kids' matches or either either film them ourselves or get our get our players to film them. And so, um, it's not all of our kids, but I'd say a majority of our kids have um, videos of their matches uh, lying around on a hard drive or, or in the cloud somewhere. Um, and so, getting them to to watch one of those and uh, and assess it. And it ends with some charting things. I don't know if that's it's one of the slides pretty close to the bottom um, charting. Mm -hmm. And so what's the value of charting and what kind of charting are you exposing the players to by watching and or going through this resource? Yeah, so there's there's obviously a, a plethora of ways to, to chart. I ended up just introducing the kids to three uh, three, essentially three charts. And so I said, oh, there we go. And so I said, uh, you know, the aggressive margin, I use a ton. Um, and as I said there, as developed by Bill Jacobson, so definitely no, no credit to me, but that's just, you know, winners plus forced errors minus unforced errors. And so uh, the pros, you know, can usually get around plus 20 for a match um, and a good junior can get plus 10. Uh, you know, if you're in the negatives, then it means obviously you're, you're, you're making too many unforced errors. And if you're, a, if you're at, you know, zero or one or two and your opponent is, uh, your opponent is at plus ten, then it probably means you're playing too passive, or you're get, you're getting dominated. And so, it's a really nice chart to figure out the balance of how aggressive versus how consistent you have to play. Uh, so that's the the first one that we go over, and then we go over um, you know, what I just called serve and return effectiveness, which is really when in this day and age, when seventy percent of the points finish in the first four shots, is is, is really critical to be able to know what's your first serve percentage. And then what are, what's your percentage of first serve points won? 
what's your second serve percentage? How many double faults are, make, are you making? And what's your percentage of second serve points won? And if you know if you've got all four of those stats in line with the norms for your age or for your level, uh, it's you know it's it's very hard to go wrong. But if you can see that your first serve percentage is you know where it needs to be, but you're not winning enough first serve points, then you know that there's something going on probably with the first ball or or maybe later in the point. Um, and similarly, if you're not making any double faults, but you're not winning enough second serve points, then you know that either the quality of the serve isn't there, or there's something with your defense or something with your first ball. So it's a it's a nice one that only requires four stats, and it can really tell you a lot about your game. <laughs> and then the last one was uh, what I just called situation effectiveness, which is very, very broad strokes. Uh, but this is a chart that we use a lot of the time. We like to be very specific in our work. Um, and so if you're working hypothetically on a situation of, you know, when I receive uh, a hard ball down the line, I'm trying to counter it cross court and, and sort of turn the point around and get in control of it. Um, this is one of the one of the best charts to do it. And so you've got five categories. Situation, you just put a tick anytime the situation happens. So anytime my opponent plays hard down the line, there's a situation. Attempted? Did I attempt the smart shot? And so did I have the guts to go and counter it, or did I just push it up the middle? Or conversely, did I try to slap it and did I play a dumb shot? So anytime you make a smart shot, you make a tick. Did the shot go in? Make a tick. Was it effective? Was it of the right quality? Make another tick if it was. And then did I win the point? Make another tick. And then at the end of that, once once you've done that, you've got a pretty good assessment of where of what's you know are you know if you're not reaching your targets, why is it? You know, like as I write in the slide there, if it's if there's a drop off from the situation to attempted, then it means you're not making the right decision enough. If, however, you're making, you know, you, you made the right decision, attempted is 10 times you attempted it, but it was only in four times, then obviously there's a consistency issue. If, however, it was in eight times, but it was only effective four times, then it's a quality problem. And then if it was effective eight out of 10 times, but you only won the point three times, then obviously there's a problem with the follow up and how you're how you're how you're building your point after that. So it's it's one of the best charts rather than just looking and saying ah oh, yeah uh, you know he's not good at countering or oh I'm not good at countering or uh, whatever it is to be able to uh, look in depth and see where the problem really is. Yeah, I would say one of the great ones and one of the most simple. We use it the first two for us are C and D could they and did they, um, but same concept and IEW stands the same way and you can almost take and draw a line down after the first two and just as you said the first two are decision making and if where things are breaking down is in the decision making process then it doesn't really matter if you're training the shot or not right you have to get the decision making right first um, the wrong decision executed well is still going to be the wrong decision so making sure that we kind of get that first part checked off and then if it's breaking down where it's not effective then figuring out how, well, how to work on it within the specifics of what came from the match court and you know well, why isn't it you know what happened in that situation are you not closing in tight enough so you can't hit that first low volley or whatever it happens to be right yeah. um huge resource i've not seen something like that being delivered to the general public what what made you think of it or how do you think of it and what made you do it other than for yourself. Well, I mean, if you, yeah, I mean, if you, if you, um, yeah, because the first, the first section we went over was patterns, and then the last one is is charting. Uh, but in the middle, there's a whole section on, on tactics and sort of game plans, and then there's also a section on anticipation, uh, tactical anticipation, being able to read people's patterns and stuff. So, so yeah, there's a lot there. Uh, you know, like I said, it really was me sitting at home going, you know, what are all the possible things that you can that you could possibly develop at home, um, you know, in, in with some level of, of quality. Obviously, you can sit there and do shadow swings and stuff, but I, I'm not a huge believer in that. Um, but I was saying, what are all the things that you can see? There's mental stuff as well. We're going to be getting our kids to, to go through. Uh, but there's also, uh, I'm also planning on releasing a document on uh, technical anticipation, being able to read people's strokes and being able to figure out where they might hit based on their setup and various factors. Um, and then, yeah, like I said, yeah, I just wanted to put it out there. I think I've gained so much just in the last couple of days from the discussion that it has generated and people coming back and saying, oh, yes, this, but what about that? And, uh, you know, I think it makes me better as a coach. And like I said, I think if the, 
coaching community as a whole grows from it and if the level of tennis as a whole grows by one you know one one millionth of a percent mm -hmm. uh as a result of this then i think that benefits me in the end you know I, we all rely on a thriving tennis industry and a thriving coaching business and uh i i think i'm not going to sit here and pretend that like i said this information is 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 95 from from louie and larry and wayne uh i'm not going to sit here and pretend that uh, this is the some secret information that i have to store away in a vault this is just information that's out there that I've packaged and and uh, it seems foolish to try and keep it to myself. But isn't that the key, right? To, to find ways to package information in a way that it will be consumed by someone at the end um, joyfully? Yeah, package it and, and execute on it. Like you said, you know, the devil is in the details and, and I'm a big, big believer that uh, so much of uh, success, at least in coaching, relies on, on, on good execution. Uh, you can know a lot, but if all you do is, is, is spout it off to the player or if you just don't know how to teach it, there, you know, once again, Louis is the, the genius behind so much of this stuff. To, to, to quote him, there's, you know, you can inform, you can form, and you can transform. You know, inform is just passing off knowledge. Forming is developing a competency and, and, or a skill, and transforming is transforming someone's belief. Uh, you know, all I'm doing is, is, you know, passing off some resources here to inform uh, but if all someone does is, you know, pass it off to the kids or read it to them, then maybe they're informing, but they're certainly not forming. And so there's a big, there's a big gap there. And uh, that's the sort of stuff that uh, really requires work, but really drives results. There's no doubt in my mind, because we've had, you know, discussions, either online discussions, or we had a pretty long phone one. Um, you yep. care about the details more than most coaches I've seen at, of your age, that you kind of tried to bleed me dry of every little bit of information that might be in me um, pretty quick. So I had to go get a little quick blood transfusion when we were done. But you've had the opportunity to do that with really other really good people, right? Larry was in charge of coach education yep. for the LTA for a long time. You work with him daily, right? Um, how do you think other coaches would benefit from seeking out experiences like you've had working with Larry. Um, I remember how excited you were when you were going. Yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't speak highly of it enough. I mean, the, the ultimate, the ultimate, uh, maybe irony is not the right word, but the, 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 the comedy in it is that we're coaches, you know, we're in the business of coaching. Presumably you believe in the value of coaching. Um, and I, yet I think so often, so few coaches have a coach for themselves, uh, and, you know, in most areas of life, that's called a mentor, but, uh, we really, you know, 90% of mentor mentee relationships are in the world of business for whatever reason. And then it just doesn't make sense. It makes so much sense to learn from someone who's done what you want to do. Um, and who's got some, or, or, who, or who has experience that you don't have or in a different area than yours. Um, but it's, it's foolish, I think to, to, to sit there and think that you can, uh, do it all on your own or learn it all on your own or that you won't benefit from someone else's expertise. And so uh, I highly, highly recommend it. And it doesn't have to be through uh, in-person mentorship. It could just be through online learning and stuff. But there is, once again, a difference between watching a YouTube video or a lecture or a presentation and going out and reaching out to someone and asking them questions and getting on a phone call and having a discussion. Uh, it's it's been uh, very beneficial uh, for me, not just with Larry, but with a couple of others as well. What have you done to determine who the people were, who, who you wanted to reach out to? Because as you go to online forums, there is a plethora of people, but you seem to have made some really good decisions. What criteria did you use? Um, that's, that is, that's a fantastic question and one that I haven't put enough thought into. I know that I fall into the human trap, the, 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 the same trap that every human falls into, which is I gravitate towards people uh, that I think are similar to me. And so one of the qualities, the qualities that I really uh, respect is uh, self-reflection um, and, and introspection. And so I'm always cautious about, uh, you know, there is this thing called accidental success. and. Uh, and I, it, that certainly is not the case for everyone, but it is the case for some people who achieve success and don't know why they have. Uh, and sometimes they get lucky. And 
uh, and then they can make the mistake. They make the mistake of attributing that success to some to something that in fact was not a contributing factor. Uh, and so I tend to look for people who are self-reflective enough to. I like to be able to say, okay, well, why do you think you were successful? What do you think you did well? What do you think you did poorly? So I tend to gravitate towards people who are self-reflective because I know then that uh, there's a level of thought that's been put into whatever advice I'm going to get. Well, thank you for taking the time to share with us. The resource is available on your website. We will place a link uh, to that website and to the article, uh, the resource specifically in the comments, then the description down below. Um, so please go and check out what's available on his website. It's not just this, there are more resources available. And as he said, he's developing more as we speak. So there's going to be a lot more. Um, thank you, Zach, for coming on today. And um, I look forward to checking back in with you soon and seeing what else you put out. Thanks so much, Dewey. It's, uh, it's always such a good time talking with you. Yeah. So this has been Tennis 2020. I'm Dewey Evans. We're all in this together. Um, you know, remember, wash your hands, don't touch your face. They're all habits. Habits are born in a moment, not in 21 days or what someone might tell you when you decide to do something, you start it right then. What takes a period of time is making sure that you don't fall back out of that habit. So create the habits you want, including putting investment into yourself by doing things like going and grabbing this resource that Zach has made available for free and other things, other places. Because when we all come back out of this, those that have used the opportunity to grow will be have taken a step forward. Till we see you again next time, it's been Dewey Evans, Tennis 2020, Real Talk, Real People, Real Life.